Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, this is Global Correlations. Uh, we're talking to uh, Russell Hanma. Uh, he's the uh, Hawaii advisor to APEC. Um, and APEC is coming up again. Welcome to the show, Russell. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you for inviting me again at this show. I know that uh, APEC uh, conferences in uh, San Francisco where all the leaders are getting together now. And uh, hopefully it's going to be starting from November 12th to the 17th. And we just finished the one in uh, Seattle, which they had the Women in uh, Economic Forum there. And, uh, and prior to that, I was there earlier prior to that uh, meetings and uh, try to help with the agriculture side and uh, got some of the universities involved, like Washington State University and some of these, because uh, they're kind of advancing uh, agriculture technology so they can supply the uh, supply chain with Washington State, as well the whole West Coast with Oregon through California. We're, we're one of the leaders in global leaders in when it comes to our food supply chain. So we should uh, promote our agriculture and farmers so we can export more food to these uh, developing nations that's uh, widely needed. You mentioned that there was a U.S.-China oh. summit meeting in San Francisco. What's the relationship of the U.S.-China summit meeting with APEC? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a very important uh, uh, meeting that uh, Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Joe Biden can meet on the sideline. Matter of fact, I wrote a letter to them uh, regarding to that. Uh, they should meet on the sideline and kind of uh, work on the, some of the trade agreement issues that was still pending when uh, Donald Trump was a president, when they put a lot of sanctions and uh, trade tariffs on some of these uh, imports that we brought. So it was like tick for tat. And we can, uh, some of these American products abroad in China still uh, have export uh, sanctions on it. So uh, we want to work on some of these trade issues and uh, continue what we can go with the phase one status right now before we can go to the phase two uh, that was uh, under the Donald Trump administration. You wrote to uh, Joe Biden, um, and I think you wrote to Kamala Harris. Um, what exactly did you suggest to them in your letter? Actually, I kind of suggested that uh, they should meet uh, Xi Jinping and uh, talk to them about some of the global issues that's still pending, not only in our trade and tariffs, but uh, the situation with uh, the freedom of navigation, the man-made islands abroad, as well as the Taiwan issue that's very controversy, because we don't want China to engage in a, a situation globally and with what Russia's trying to do with the Ukraine war, as what, what's happening in Israel with uh, Hamas uh, at the Gaza Strip. And we're afraid that uh, China might lean towards uh, Russia to help them with the arms control and supply some of these goods to promote the war, global wars. And we don't want them to get involved with the World War Three kind of status with Taiwan and kind of with the situation what's going on with North, North Korea with Kim and Moon regime. <laughs> Because I know that uh, Vladimir Putin has uh, met uh, Kim and Un, and uh, they had discussed some of those kind of issues. Let me <laughs> confirm some things here. Um, do we more. know that both Joe Biden and Xi Jinping are going to be at this meeting in San Francisco? Do we know that? I think they haven't officially made an announcement uh, exactly where and what time they're going to meet. But I know there's uh, within the state officials through the foreign ministry as well with our state department uh i know there's they're working on some of the logistics and agenda and i'm not privy to see exactly what they're trying to uh what agenda they're going to be discussing but i'm just kind of coming to make some suggestion from the overall picture which direction we should move based on what the the past administration has done so, so you need... you gave some advice to uh joe biden and kamala harris about what should be discussed, I guess, at this uh, summit. Um, did they respond to you? Did they agree or disagree? Did anybody from the White House contact you over it? Not exactly. They haven't let uh, made me an official uh, acknowledgement saying that thank you or anything, but uh, I'm sure they had uh, read it and uh, know what the content is about. And hopefully that in terms of Kalama Harris, uh, uh, she being the vice president, I know she took the gavel during the uh, Thailand summit and said that we're going to be hosting in San Francisco. So I hope she takes the leadership in charge and maybe we'll get India, uh, Maldives to be there and we can maybe 
make announcement that India can be a member of the 22nd uh, APEC organization. And uh, that might kind of enlighten uh, a lot of the uh, trade with India as well and have our better relationship with them. So is Kamala Harris going to be at the summit? I hope so. Definitely, she's the one that grabbed the gavel when she was at the uh, uh, Thailand summit last November. So I know that Joe Biden had to uh, uh, go to the East Asia summit in ASEAN. So uh, the time conflict and had to go return back to Washington. So I know Kamala Harris took the the gavel instead and said, "Hey, we're going to have it in San Francisco." So I hope that uh, the people and the mayor over there. London Breed and uh, the governor, uh, New, uh, Gavison Newsom, the uh, governor of California, is gearing up for this big uh, uh, gathering within the APEC, uh, Asia Pacific region leaders. And ho hopefully, the European Union leaders should be there because uh, last couple of days ago. Wait, Madison, wait, wait a minute. If this is an APEC meeting, there are what, 20, 22 countries, 21 countries? Uh, in APEC, and those are the ones that are invited. I, I didn't know they included uh, the uh, European Union uh, or anyone outside, what, Asia Pacific. It's all about Asia Pacific, isn't it? Why why are these other countries involved? I think uh, they're, they're more like a sideline observers, I would say, because I know the European Union want to uh, work together with the APEC organization. And I've been kind of uh, pushing that, matter of fact, uh, uh, where the European Union with 28 countries plus Brexit can uh, work to go together with the APEC organization, which has 21 countries, plus, if we include India, it would be the 22nd member, plus all the other ASEAN countries who wants to be a member. Uh, so we want to basically have this Euro-Asia uh, Infrastructure Development Bank, what China's trying to do, but we're going to use the economic framework uh, with the West countries, because uh, within the organization, that I think will make it fair to all small and medium countries to get their fair share. You know, Russell, I thought that um, uh, APEC rotated the venue around among its 21 members. Um, but uh, we had APEC here, what, less than 10 years ago um, in Hawaii. And now this is happening in San Francisco. It's both places are in the United States. What happened to the rule about rotating so that every country gets a shot at it every 21 years? I think what happened was basically uh, when we hosted in 2011, that's 12 years ago, when President Barack Obama was the president, and I happened to be on the uh, APEC Business Advisory Council representing Hawaii. And I might have, uh, that got me started with coming up with a, uh, a, a paper on working together with a small and medium uh, enterprise should work with a, a large enterprise. And I kind of critiqued some of the uh, write-ups. But anyways, uh, going back, uh, the rotation, uh, maybe because of the COVID and the economic situation that we're in, we need to have a stable country to host it. And uh, matter of fact, next year, Peru has going to be hosting the 2024 APEC conference. And 2025, two years from now, it's going to be hosted in Seoul, Korea. So every two years, they're going to have a voting. Now, that... you've, been, you've been following APEC for, oh, gee, uh, more, more than a decade for sure. And you were the advisor to the APEC in, what, 2011 that took place here in Hawaii. And you wrote the, um, or at least you wrote a draft of the APEC master plan uh, I, I'm assuming that's the framework, the economic framework you talked about. But but question is, how has APEC changed over the years? Because, Russell, the world has changed over the years. And right now we have, um, you know, a number of hotspots around the world. We have two active wars, um, to say nothing about the Armenian conflict, uh, to say nothing about the Taiwan threat. Um, we have all kinds of stresses and strains and geopolitical issues and declines. And one would think that APEC will have changed over the past few years. During the Trump administration, um, when he didn't really bring things together, he rather separated them. Um, and um, like with his sanctions and the tension with China and so forth. Um, so how has APEC changed? This ought to be an historic meeting 
because of the changes and because of the tone and the relationships individually and um, by country. What do you think? I'm glad you asked that question. I'm glad that you alliterated up that, Jay. Uh, you know, in terms of APEC, uh, I number when I started, we're all pushing for this Bogar uh, amendment, uh, Bogar doctrine, where by year of 2020, all APEC countries should have a free trade area in the Indo or Asia Pacific region. We call it Indo Pacific region now, but uh, back then we call it Asia Pacific region. And hopefully, uh, have a free trade agreement with those countries. So in other words, all APEC regions uh, through that, I would say 60% of the global trade will have a free trade area. And I was trying to make Hawaii and TPP was one of the free trade agreement for United States, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement. And China came up with the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Free Trade, and got the ASEAN countries involved. <clears throat> so hopefully there was a little conflict. So. That kind of persuaded when uh, Donald Trump came in office, he withdrew from the TPP. And when Biden came in, we call it now the economic framework. So that is a new uh, terminology that we use now, economic framework. And what is that? Hopefully we have India and Fiji involved with the TPP members. But China is kind of getting smart. So this meaning... Uh, with all this geopolitical situation globally, what's happening with the Ukraine war, with the uh, supply chain issues, as well uh, the Israel war with the Hamas and the terrorist group, with the Iran involved, with the BRICS nation, because the BRICS uh, nations included Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, so the Iranians are involved with it. So there's a lot of uh, players are involved with the geopolitical situation. So I think what China wants to do with the Xi Jinping's meeting with uh, Joe Biden is significant because they want to kind of understand what's going on globally with geopolitical. And China wants to play a major role to kind of be a intermediator or more like keep up with their peace plan that they submitted with the Ukraine war maybe. And they want to make good ties with the United States and they can move forward in a better way instead of banging heads and doing this tick for tack kind of trade war. We need to resolve some of these sanctions and move forward with the trade, uh, trade issues that is very crucial because we're generating, you know, even the Donald Trump, when he pushed for the, uh, uh, the sanctions, we gross about $360 billion annually on the sanctions. So we kind of, that's still sitting in limbo. So the U.S. Treasury is collecting roughly about $360 billion of trade tariffs, import tax from what China that we bring. Yeah, but then it's giving price supports to the farmers and the like. So it's uh, it's really not a win, a win for the U.S. But let, let's move on. Let's go to the question of the United States attitude toward international agreements. Um, we, we have a, a time in our history right now, ever since... Uh, I guess it, it was revealed ever since Trump was in office, and, and that is that we are isolationist, and the Republican Party is isolationist. They're not too concerned with uh, international agreements and cooperation. I imagine they're not too concerned with APEC. Um, and so that, that has been a real problem in terms of um, supporting countries that need our support, such as Ukraine and Israel. It's been a problem um, in dealing with uh, the Armenian conflict, um, and it's, you know, it's, and for that matter, Taiwan. So wh what I get though is that uh, although the administration does the right thing and wants to do the right thing, Congress is mm, largely isolationist. Um, is anybody from Congress going to be at this summit? Is Congress interested in APEC? Is it interested in, in Indo-Pacific? Is it interested in these uh, diplomatic meetings and trade meetings uh, that, are, that customarily take place at APEC? Or is it that they don't come and they don't care? Well, good thing you asked me. They do care. It's just that uh, the common people or the, uh, the top 10% uh, of the elites of the CEOs and the business and the Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Chamber are participating on this with the International Trade Administration's uh, U.S. Commerce Department pushing for these kind of uh, dialogues and trade shows beside the State Department. 
So uh, you see a lot of the, uh, in terms of the leadership, uh, we just finished the G7 summit. Like you said, the global leaders, the G7 is pretty big with the European leaders there. And they had it in Japan. Japan hosted the ministers. So I know that Anthony Blinken was there and they had a good dialogue. And uh, they were saying that how important global situation is and had, had, they have to work together to bring harmony and peace again. So in other words, the G7 countries within the European Union are part of the G7. So they got representation there as well. So uh, that's going to be, and I think they're going to might be at the San Francisco uh, APEC conference. They're going to be a sideline observer. So you'd be surprised, you know, there's people kind on this conference in San Francisco. And hopefully uh, we can revive and uh, put that in their economic plan and make San Francisco like it was before uh, the Pacific of uh, Financial Center. And that might be a good approach. And they need to restructure the Silicon Valley issue. So I know they're promoting hard on the artificial intelligence. And is anybody from Congress going to show up? Uh, oh, yeah. Is anybody from the Republican Party going to show up? Because after all, this affects the country and, and it affects the world. It certainly affects trade and the economy. So, so query: um, Do they care enough to come, or are they just uh, hiding and uh, being isolationist? Well, I'm not an insider for Washington D.C., but uh, I know the United States Trade Representative offers Catherine Tai. She's our trade representative for, uh, under the Executive Office of the White House under Joe Biden administration. So, I know they're pushing hard for this, and they're pushing for the economic framework to work. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that's going to bring our friends and allies and uh, partners together and do this EuroAsia uh, infrastructure development. So they want to bring the uh, whoever wants to be part of our team, uh, wants to be part of the economic framework. And I think that China wants to eventually want to be a member with the economic framework. And instead of competing, I know they want to work together. So mm -hmm. maybe that meeting with Xi Jinping and Joe Biden is going to be a, a crucial meeting. And I hope it their friendship that they had in the past going to pay off and uh, they, we can move forward. One thing that uh, people are concerned about is uh, China's attempts to um, steal our intellectual property and to steal our technology and to steal, to hack and steal our data. There's pre plenty of evidence about that, including, of course, uh, AI uh, technology. And, um, you know, there have been a number of revelations over that by intelligence agencies um, expressing great concern over China's uh, focused attempts uh, to compete unfairly with the United States on technology and, and commercial secrets, if you will, and government secrets. So query, um, is this something that um, Joe Biden would be able to talk to Xi Jinping about are you are you suggesting that they discuss this? I know within the trade, of representatives of their counterparts are already trying to resolve this kind of issues. But uh, I know that in terms of uh, spying espionage, state uh, with the State Department, they're still uh, unquestioning with what happened in the past with the spy balloon, all this hacking within the Pentagon and the national. <laughs> Security issues are very concerned, and even with our intellectual property right, rights, with infringement and copyrights, you know, in terms of uh, uh, those kind of matters, has to be issued in order to we go on this trade uh, phase two level that's still pending. We haven't got to that phase two, which talks about the intellectual property rights. If they can get to that and prove that they're an uh, honorable country to honor these uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, maybe we can make him a member of the economic framework. Mm. That was that I made. And what about uh, you know the the, the uh, South China Sea? You mentioned it earlier. It's it's really a problem, and uh, the provocations are increasing around the South by by China around the South China Sea uh, on Filipino fishing and trade, and of course uh, on Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait. So. <clears throat> Well, can this come up? Is this coming up in the APEC meeting in the summit in San Francisco? Well, that got to be included in the agenda. I know there's a lot of subcommittees in, in terms of U.S. fish and wildlife, in terms of 
uh, uh, tonnage of the catch of the tuna and the fish that uh, they do in an international water. So I know there's an association that looks at that kind of quota in terms of uh, how much uh, fish and uh, natural resources that they can collect per year in terms of tonnage. So each country has that kind of regulation. So I hope the international organization looks at that kind of uh, matters. I'm sure there is a concern. I know the ASEAN countries are very concerned about that through their waters, you know, because they're, that's their uh, butter and bread for their livelihood. So uh, the fishery industry is very important to them. Well, you know, on the South China Sea, there was a case in front of the International Court in The Hague um, regarding, um, you know, maritime maritime freedom uh, in, in the South China Sea. And uh, China, China didn't come, even though China is a signatory to that agreement. And, and then the decision uh, went against China and in favor of the Philippines a few years ago. Um, and China has ignored the, ignored the decision. Uh, so that raises the whole question about international um, uh, bodies and organizations. So we have here APEC, which is important theoretically for economic framework, but we also have the United Nations and the International Court in The Hague. Um, how, what's the connection between this summit and APEC and the United Nations and the International Court? Um, as, you know, as you know, Jay, the United Nations is a, a world opinion and uh, it's formed after the World War II to have a, a world opinion of what countries are. And APEC is similar too. There's not a binding organization, but uh, it's a world opinion and voice that each country's a member can uh, meet and tell the leaders and get the CEO businesses to understand what impacts in terms of economy and economic development and uh, how they can move forward to feed our country and promote import export for the industry. So that's what APEC stands for, Economic Opportunity and Cooperation. And uh, United Nations has this whole human, they have different committees like uh, trusteeship, the social committee, the security committee that's very concerned with North Korea right now with Russian invasion of Ukraine and the uh, situation in Israel. No, they uh, may be concerned so about it, but they, have, they haven't uh, done anything uh, about it. The United Nations hasn't done anything with regard to the war crimes in Ukraine um, or with regard to, um, you know, the contention in the Middle East. Yeah, so you, uh, I don't know how they could deal with China on some of these issues where China has staked the position, has ignored the United Nations, the International Court. I mean, is there any chance that at this meeting in San Francisco that China will change its position um, about, um, about the Pacific, about the South China Sea and so forth? Well, I think going back to your first question about the case of the Philippines before I answer your question, Jay. Uh, in Philippines case, I remember when uh, uh, Duterte was the president and uh, when the International Court of Justice in terms of the man-made island territories or territorial issue of the international border lines, uh, they declared that it was against the law and uh, and they awarded the uh, Philippines to move forward with the international court so they can claim those man-made islands as Philippines. But what happened was Xi Jinping made a deal with uh, Duterte, so Duterte didn't move forward with that. But now with the new president, Bon Bon Jr., uh, Marcus Flan, uh, Flan Marcus Flan Jr. took the presidency. So he's on the U.S. side because he was kind of raised in Hawaii. He understands the ramification of the military and department defense when we had that Subic Bay and Clark Air Force Base. And Subic Bay was a naval base. So we have other, other bases that's going to be in Philippines eventually. But uh, so what is happening is the, uh, the cars has turned around. So if they want to, they can still proceed with the uh, International Court of Justice in Hague with uh, those man-made islands. And I think that's the, where the direction is going. And to your question about Xi Jinping's uh, uh, situation with uh, uh, our national security uh, issues, uh, I hope the working group bring those kind of issues and hope the State Department and their counterpart, uh, uh, Ziang, or the, uh, their... Uh, 
counselor of uh, international foreign policy can bring those issues what uh, Anthony Blinken, our secretary, and what, what this meeting between Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Joe Biden at the APEC conference is probably more like a friendly kind of meeting that they understand which direction and they're going to get organizations and committees together and try to resolve those kind of issues and saying that we're still friendship. But what gets to me is the bad timing with those panda bears in Washington, the zoo over there, the Smithsonian Zoo. They just left those uh, three pandas going back to uh, Beijing again. So we need to bring back those panda bears back, you know, if we want to uh, enhance our, you know, keep our relationship with uh, China and Beijing. What do this you think? is going to be a, a, what, a four or five day uh, conference in San Francisco. I really wonder whether there's enough time to discuss and at least um, uh, look at options for solutions, uh, especially between the U.S. and China. Um, and I, I actually have my doubt about it. One thing, one thing of concern, though, and maybe you can look back in your mind to what happened in 2011, is that this is, um, you know, economic cooperation. It's not raw meat news like a war um, or a provocation in the South China Sea. It's economic cooperation. APEC is not generally known, and the, the people of this country don't necessarily follow it. And the press doesn't necessarily cover it. Um, I wonder how much the press covered it in 2011, whether it covered it to your satisfaction. And um, uh, Brian Schatz was uh, actively involved on behalf of the state of Hawaii at that time. I wonder if it covered it to his satisfaction. And I wonder if you have any expectations on whether the press will be in San Francisco and whether the press will cover all these various issues, um, you know, and contentions and options that should be discussed at this conference. Will the press be there? What are your expectations about it? Oh, yeah, definitely. There'll be a lot of international <clears throat> press news media. You'll be surprised with Asia Pacific. They'll be in the uh, highlights and uh, they'll be talking about it. It's just that we need to promote that and uh, move forward. I remember when, when Brian Schatz was a lieutenant governor, he because, uh, uh, became a, a U.S. senator uh, when Neil Abbott came in. I took over that after that for the past 10 years. So I kind of enhanced APEC Hawaii and what we stand for. So globally, they recognize Hawaii and they recognize us. Uh, and we play a major contributing role to bring in peace, security, economic. No, well, prosperity. you know, you, you say that, but and no. indeed, in 2011, Hawaii was there because APEC was ha happening at the convention center, as I recall, and there was a lot of, um, you know, questions about security and uh, and uh, and trying to get people to understand this was a special situation, a special international situation. But now this summit is in San Francisco. And, you know, you suggest that Hawaii has a role. But what is Hawaii's role when the summit is in San Francisco? What do you expect Hawaii is going to contribute or learn or influence uh, this group? I'm glad you, you mentioned that, Jay. Uh, in terms of not only academics and business, we have our, uh, our Hawaiian culture. We have our hokulea, global turf. Matter of fact, in Seattle, when I was there, I was trying to hope uh, promoting Hokulea is going to make this indigenous uh, global tour with the uh, Hawaiians and the Pacific Islanders. So what we wanted to do was unite all the indigenous people from the Alaska, Native Americans, all the way down the coast of uh, South America through the Incas and the Brazilians, uh, all the way down to the uh, uh, people that's... So what, what Hokulea's mission is... Uh, bringing all the people together from their home country who are indigenous people. And they're the backbone of those countries. And uh, they can share their knowledge. They can share their environment, their wisdom, what sustainability is all about, living off the earth and the land. And uh, then their culture exchange. That is a big thing. And next year is going to be Peru. Did you know the Peru? They got the Incas there and the history. Oh, of the manlyhood of South America. So I think the whole... The Hokulea crew is going to have a blast. What about, what about climate change? Can we offer them anything about our work on climate change? Oh, yeah, definitely. We're still the, 
we're the leaders in terms of uh, Paris Agreement. You know, we came up the first uh, uh, green energy plan that we're going to be sensibility energy fossil free by year 2045. And uh, when Governor Ige was, David Ige was a governor, we signed a proclamation on that. And now, is, that there anybody, is there anybody from Hawaii who is going to go to San Francisco and present on climate change? I'm not sure. I'm not sure on that one who's going to be the one. But uh, I know that John Kerry, our former Secretary of State, is uh, carrying the torch and uh, making sure that we are sensibility, you know, overall with the uh, we're meeting that Paris Agreement. Hopefully, we're trying to be a leader with the sensibility with energy free and kind of with the alternative energy source and all above. Okay, we're out of time. We're out of time, Russell. Let me offer you one minute to summarize and leave whatever message you want to leave with our viewers. Take one minute. Well, to the viewers, I think this economic summit in San Francisco not only plays only the regional in terms of West Coast and Asia, uh, but I think it affects globally. Uh, in terms of geopolitically, what's happening with uh, Ukraine, with the supply chain issues, with Russia invasion, what's happening with uh, Israel, with Hamas and the terrorist group. What's now we're getting all the other uh, Palestinians and other uh, terrorist group that's kind of being backed by Syria, Iran, and human. Human just came out with the Houthini uh, back with the Syrian war, and Syria has that. Uh, uh, not besides Hamas, they have uh, different kind of terrorist groups that's coming up. So uh, it doesn't look good. And I hope that in terms of Jewish people in Israel, we support them because they think it's going to be a holy war. They're the backbone of uh, the Christianity uh, with Jerusalem and all that. So uh, I can see what Yaten Yahu was mentioning when he summoned all the ambassadors there and told them that this is a holy war for the to the for the West and of the free democracy. So I hope that doesn't escalate to Asia and uh, affects the uh, economic situation. So maybe China can somehow work with the uh, situation, you know, tell Vladimir Putin to uh, kind of, you know, detone and diffuse some of these uh, aggressions. We got to go, Russell. Uh, thank you very, very much. Really appreciate you coming on. I I I, I hope the um, the summit is successful. Thank you very much, and uh, I do and salam. <laughs> Aloha.